Okay, so hello um, and welcome to this Pi webinar. Um, thank you very much for joining us uh, from all around the world. Um, we are going to be talking uh, today about innovation and funding in digital education um, and considering blended learning and virtual classrooms. So first, let me start with some introductions. My name is Will Knott um, and I am the digital editor here at the Pi News. Um, today, we are joined by Bernardo Amador, who's Territory Manager of X2O Media. We have Joao Santos, who is Deputy Head of Units in the Directorate General for Employment, Social Affairs and Inclusion at the European Commission. We have Maud Poles, who's Project Leader of Education uh, Innovation at Amsterdam Business School. Um, Salvatore uh, Mosia, who's Director Global Executive MBA at Universidad Internacional de La Rioja. And we have Rad Wang, who is Managing Director of RISE Education Technologies. Um, they're going to introduce themselves in a bit more detail in just a minute. But um, before we get started, um, there are just a few housekeeping points. Um, we have a question function at the bottom of the screen. Uh, where you can ask questions and vote for others. So uh, do use that um, and we'll get to some of those questions um, and get them answered later on in the session. Right, so um, let's jump straight in. Um, Bernardo, could you give me a bit of an introduction to yourself, um, but also to uh, X2O and the work that you're doing? Hi, lovely to meet you all. I'm Bernardo Amador and I work at X2O Media. I've been working with education for over 10 years now. And at X2O Media, we have our headquarters in Montreal, Canada, uh, and we have a London uh, uh, base in Europe, uh, being that one in London. X2O Media has been established since 2006. It was acquired by Stratacash in 2018. Our journey started with distance learning spaces, uh, which really began with a history uh, designing a room for the Harvard University. And then we built and executed their uh, Harvard uh, Business School Live Virtual Classroom. We now work with some of the world, uh, world's biggest educational institutions worldwide uh, and business schools, so universities, business schools, K-12 as well, to provide blended learning environments that are asynchronous, uh, sorry, synchronous, immersive and interactive. It is flexible, adaptable, scalable and engaging. Uh, and for me, one of the biggest assets is that we don't only provide a synchronous uh, solution, but we also provide an asynchronous uh, learning capability through the possibility of recording the session, access to all the content in session and after the session, as well as polls and answers. So really trying to provide a, a full rounded solution to universities and business schools. Okay, great. Um, could, uh, uh, Joao, um, could you sort of tell us a little bit about um, your work and, and, and what, what you're doing? Sure. I think probably I'm the only one not related to higher education here because, in fact, I work at the European Commission. I suppose you all know what the European Commission is, but, um, uh, you know, within the Commission, we have various departments. I'm working in one specifically dealing with employment and social affairs. And within this, uh, I'm the deputy head of unit responsible for um, the coordinating European policy on vocational education and training, as well as the Erasmus uh, um, program. I suppose the Erasmus program you've heard about. It's not only about higher education uh, students that go in mobility, but also vocational education and training. We, are, we, have, we finance around 200,000 learners every year that go on uh, um, traineeships abroad. And, uh, and this is basically it. And we're also responsible not only for vocational training, but everything has to do with upskilling and reskilling of adults. So the education system per se, but with a focus on vocational education and training. For those that are not familiar with it, vocational education and training starts usually, uh, not in all countries, but between the age of 15 and 19, so upper secondary school level. And then it also happens at tertiary level, mainly with um, University of Applied Sciences, Polytechnic, so also at third at the tertiary level, but not the traditional academic uh, uh, schools, but all these uh, more um, uh, applied sciences uh, route. 
Okay, perfect. Um, I'll go to uh, Maud next. Um, do you want to, yeah, tell me a bit about uh, yourself and the work that you're doing at Amsterdam Business School? Yes, okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome. I see a lot of people coming in and I see that they're from everywhere. So that's really nice. So my name is Maud Pols, so in Dutch, and I see quite some Dutch people actually, it's Maud. But in English, you can go for Maud, that sounds better. <laughs> I work as a um, project leader, educational innovation for the Amsterdam Business School. And it's interesting because before COVID, I was working on like some projects with lectures that say, oh, I want to do something with VR. That was just an exception. And I think we all know that that then everything changed. And since then I've been working on uh, the implementation of proctoring software. But another project which is interesting here is more about hybrid learning. So we set up a hybrid learning theater and I can show in the chat, maybe at some point I have a link to a video so you get a little idea. Um, and I, I basically help the, the lecturers and set up the policy, how to do everything online in these times. So I'm very curious to hear about the others and looking forward to it today. Okay, great. Um, and Salvatore, could you sort of introduce yourself and, and, and yeah, tell, tell the audience a bit about your work? Thank you and good morning. And uh, it's a pleasure to share with you this, uh, this conference, this virtual conference. I'm Professor Salvatore Mocha and uh, I work as a director of executive education at the University, International University, UNIR La Rioja in Spain. Actually, we are based in Spain, but we work a lot at international level because we have a lot of students coming from, from South America. And so uh, we are, let's say, a little bit different from Amsterdam Business School and the other university here because we were born as a digital university. I mean, we were born already as online university and we are already applying a lot of technology. So uh, during this period of time, uh, we have been growing a lot. And what we are doing now, we are... Uh, planning how to expand our education in a, in the higher sector and we would like to, to apply what we have been learning up to today in uh, teaching at a degree and master level we want to apply this also to executive education and we are working on several programs that are as you can imagine based online thank you very much and uh, i'll be here uh, if you have some questions thank you okay um I, 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 Finally, um, Rad, could I, um, uh, yeah, hope to you and it'd be great to hear a little bit more about the work you do. Yeah, so um, the shirt I'm wearing, I, I actually work for Vincennes University. I report to uh, directly to the president of the university. Uh, I'm kind of an oddball, I think, in uh, higher ed because I actually have a, a tech background. Uh, but at the same time, you know, some of the things that we're doing in um, higher education is uh, my, my focus has been around recruitment and global collaboration. And uh, the need for technology has always been there. And as Mald has said, uh, with COVID, it kind of stimulated everything to go a lot faster. So we actually do custom online cohorts by region right now for uh, some of our students. And as those projects kind of got kicked off, it kind of expanded even more into uh, high schools as well. So. Uh, pretty broadly, both on the university and the, the high school side, in terms of my, my company, I'm actually the managing director for Rise Education Technologies. We also deal with some proctoring uh, services. I sit on the board of a, a proctoring uh, software company as well, based out of Singapore. So I, I kind of dabble in quite a bit because I think the whole value chain is uh, quite broad and there's a need a across the board. And I, actually, I think, um, you know, I just want to say thank you. And it's a pleasure to uh, to uh, be part of this panel. Okay, perfect. Um, I'll get on to some sort of uh, other questions. And Bernardo, if it's like if I start with you, um, what are some of the innovations that are being made in terms of classroom tech? Um, can you tell me a little bit more about uh, what the future is likely to hold? So I believe that nowadays there's a lot of things happening, right? So um, due to recent events, you'll see that. Uh, uh, institutions have had to modernize themselves a lot but you have from the asynchronous MOOC uh, to live virtual uh, augmented re uh, virtual reality um, in my opinion e-learning is still an is is not a new thing right but the dynamics and the experience have changed through time uh, the willingness of changing 
something that is so so embedded into our way of living is that is so old like the learning environment has struggled to 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 move forward the crisis has allowed that to 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 happen faster um gracefully for us uh unfortunately for others i assume but with three difficult times comes great fruition right whether it is uh, k-12 universities and k-12 stands really for um uh senior school uh, uh in other countries so or universities business schools it's about really trying to bring that transnational uh, education into um a digital world so uh to me the future what really holds is augmented virtual reality machine learning and ai through uh distance learning Eventually, you'll also have the possibility to, through analytics, to measure the success of a set of a session, of a of the deliverance of the teacher, such as his tone, if it applies to the audience that he's talking to, as well as the facial interpretation of students and whether that session is more adaptable to a different type of person. In other words, what you're really doing is measuring talent, professor talent, and uh, student talent through an education without borders. Yeah, okay, perfect. Um, I, I think it's fascinating, the idea of, um, uh, I think is it called extended reality in terms of, you know, uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, um, how that might start to play a part. Um, I mean, is X2O looking towards um, that space at the moment or? we always look to to improve ourselves so our roadmap is actually built uh via the the the, the teachers um inputs so we work very closely with uh, with uh, uh multiple institutions no matter what what grade they are right so uh whatever the the future holds we will strive to to go through through uh, through that uh whether it is in the short term or long term so we obviously deliver analytics um participation levels, engagement levels, um, whether it is the raise of hands or time within the session, or even if they get distracted by going to other platforms, other websites and so on, that data holds, uh, what that data holds is the possibility for the teacher to improve himself to give a better experience, right? Mm -hmm. It's all about the next level, whether it is, and if I pick on, on Salvatore who was speaking about executive education, you can't expect a basic platform to deliver for the most expensive course that you have at your institution. It's just not financially viable or justifiable, right? And so uh, we are working currently with a couple of, of uh, end users, the possibility of bringing virtual reality into their world, really going to the next level. Uh, or for example, with uh, a very specific uh, case in the US, we're bringing uh, hard skill training through online education. And that means that they can actually show how to operate a body into, uh, you know, through remote learning. Okay. Um, I think that, that sort of leads on to a question I have uh, for you, Mal, which I'll say instead of more. <laughs> wow, you choose the Dutch version, great. <laughs> um, Basically, um, in terms of uh, the sort of the value of what you're offering to students, I mean, how, how do you uh, universities how do universities justify student fees uh, sort of when they're not teaching in person? You know, uh, do, do, and, and, and do, do students kind of expect more sophisticated tech solutions? You know, if they're paying higher fees, say particularly on MBA programs or, or, or the like. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. So first of all, I think it's best to say that online education costs more. It also costs a lot. There's, I think the internet is a kind of off or is it still working? I'm just continuing with my talk, but I think Will has frozen. <laughs> you see Will frozen? Yes. Well, no worries. Yes, well. So it does, uh, online education also costs a lot, right? So there's investments that need to be made. And I definitely see that in the MBA there's higher expectations, right? Because they say, oh, we, we pay the fee for this, so we expect something different, something more sophisticated. Um, so we also looked into as a university, if for these MBA students, if what the experience is like, if you can actually make sure because it's smaller groups to get them 
on campus. Well, what we did is actually went to hotels because they were empty. So that was uh, the right thing to do, I think, because you could also help this industry a little bit. I see that we'll disconnect it, but I'm just continuing with my answer because I think that's best for everyone, right? Um, and probably you guys also recognize that, right? That you're looking for other solutions and to, to get more sophisticated uh, solution. And as I said in the beginning about this hybrid learning feature, that was quite a large investment. So it's a, Hi there. hey, you're back, Will. <laughs> Sorry, it's me, you know. Sorry, my apologies. No worries. We, were, we just continued and we waited for you to get back. So yeah, yeah, perfect. perfect. We're happy Thank you're you. back. I just quickly explain a little bit like, and I think we all recognize that, that you look for other solutions and yeah. especially the MBA, they have higher expectations. Uh, so we work together with hotels to actually mm -hmm. create the, this remote solution there and to create the atmosphere of like connecting to each other. Um, and I was talking about this hybrid learning theater again, yeah. uh, which was a large investment in the first place. But if you look at what it actually did to the student experience and the lecture experience mm -hmm. they were not they didn't realize they could have education this way there was there were also some things that we could maybe after covid still continue doing i mean within this hybrid learning for example now i see albert matilda emil i see everyone is there listening to us and if we would have this interactive webinar where i could talk to them i have way more options online. And uh, I think we could actually build on to that. So as Bernardo just explained, you guys are working on these uh, virtual platforms and um, well, with the whole avatars, for example, that sounds like more sophisticated, but we have to look into if it adds value to the quality of the education and how we want to continue after COVID, uh, what could stay and what could maybe not stay because it maybe does not contribute to what we want to achieve together mm -hmm. but i think it's an interesting question and that we're all working on that to, to figure out what works best now and after covid if there's completely a... agree mm -hmm. and yeah. it's it's not one one solution fits all right so sometimes you need to have multiple tools at your disposal for different contexts yeah. right exactly. so it's exactly. about providing that uh that enhanced experience but shared across the necessities of each department because obviously me a medical faculty doesn't have the same necessities as the executive program and so on yes. exactly may i add something more uh, yeah. she was she was saying before that uh the online education uh, it it does not cost less than the the, the, the physical education and it, it's true i mean technologies are costly and it's not just a matter of technology it's also a matter of having a staff supporting online education when you are teaching online it's just not having a professor on the other side with his computer and the screen it's more than that for example we have a complete staff of people supporting us from a technical perspective we have people supporting the students also from other perspective and so the student even if is uh, attending an online university is like a university it's a sort of virtual university so he has the on the the, tu the the tutors he has the the support etc etc so everything costs a lot so again we should uh, we should leave the concept that online education is just having a computer. And as Bernard also was saying, the technologies are changing a lot and you, can all, you cannot always use the same technology for every kind of student. You have to make experiments. We do some a lot of experiments in terms of technology mm -hmm. and it costs money. Yeah. Um, Salvatore, there's, there's a question I actually have for you, which, um, because I know that you teach both face-to-face uh, -face, but also online. Um, and, and I thought it'd be quite interesting to hear from you, sort of, how, how do any innovations How do you make sure that they are teacher-led rather than technology-led? Um, and, you know, how do you bring teachers in so they uh, feel comfortable with, with, with new tech? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> teaching online, I would say that it's not easy. I, it's better, it's easier, I would say, it's a general rule, it's easier to teach face-to-face -face also because when you are face-to-face, -face, you have the, the feedback 
from the students. So if you are say something, you can see the faces, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, teaching online again, it's not just uh, speaking to a computer. You have you need interaction, and to get interaction with online students, it's it's not easy. I mean, they have to to, to understand you the personality of each professor is different and this is amplified when you are online because then you have only a few minutes to to to, to connect with them and uh, but again this is not an excuse not to innovate every day for me i strive to bring to class new articles new cases etc cetera, etc cetera, because i need to get their attention because i'm sure that they are there but they are looking probably at the whatsapp screen yeah. and if they are in the room i can see them i can stop them but if i'm not in the room i have always to give them something more valuable than the whatsapp yeah. and this is a big challenge well bernardo that's it's probably a good point now in terms of engagement um how have you felt uh, well so far you know how have um uh universities responded to uh what you're offering at x2o and and, and, and how you can help with engagement both for, for students but also for, for teachers it's it's quite a hefty question because we are right in the middle of a crisis um our our system the way it's built requires uh, a pre-installation so we do require to physically go in space all obviously COVID safe don't, don't get me wrong but it does bring some limitations so it's not the standard teams where you have just an app uh, but that's why you have differences and sometimes you need the, the variety right the 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 space that i'm in and you can see it behind me i have multiple screens that's because of the immersiveness of, of our solution just so it happens that i'm in the office for us to be able to give that added level that 3d5 of the room you really need to to have infrastructure you need multiple screens you need multiple cameras mm -hmm. um and it gives that immersiveness that that uh, that sense that when I look at the student, I'm literally looking him in the eyes. And so he's kind of forced to participate and engage with me, whether he likes it or not, because I can see his actions. I can interpret his reactions. I can also know if he's not paying attention to my screen. So, you know, that comes at, at, at a, a, a demand, which is having multiple, multiple AV equipment, uh, such as the one you see behind. Now, uh, I, I know uh, uh, Maud wants to compliment, uh, but adding to this, there was a question that I thought was relevant. It's about how do you bring the positive impact into virtual learning? And I think it ties in quite well with this. We were working with, with a specific business school and their message was they, they, they measure uh, the efficiency of their courses. And one sentence that stri uh, strikes me is when the, the student says, it's almost better than being in real life. And when they do the, uh, the, the, the assessment, the result goes that they got better feedback from our virtual reality, our virtual learning space, than actually they ever got in their history within the space. I think that speaks about, first of all, the willingness to adapt from both teacher and the student. Second of all, the understanding of the complexity that universities and struggles that universities are going through or institutions are going through through this time because obviously there will be limitations now it also shows how much universities are prepared to really give back and you you'll hear that in france and the uk there was a discussion should a student get fees back or should you really charge overseas fees to international students the only way to justify it is by providing a unique experience okay and, and so, Mal, um, could, could, could you sort of answer me uh, sorry answer that point as well uh, sorry i see salvatore's trying to ask something as well but but yeah Mal, could you yeah well, I think it's really interesting uh, what you just said, Bernardo, and I, I think something that I just saw also in the chat, if we, we link to the people that actually tell us, Kath and Albert, they talk about the course redesign and about trainings. Mm -hmm. So, of course, Bernardo, if we have this nice technology, it's virtual, it works, it's like fancy, you know what I mean? We, of course, need the skills for that, and not only for the students, also for the lecturers. And I think that's what we've all been working on the past half year to also get like it's kind of like change management it's it's 
skills, a new skill set that you have to develop. And I think that's equally and actually even more important to make this successful because you can have the, the best technology, but if your people don't know how to use it or are not comfortable with it, you really need to go through a skill set change. And um, that's not only course redesign, it's also training. And that's interesting, maybe if you want to talk about that, Will, if you talk about mm. teacher-led or technology-led. Yeah, yeah. I think this is the start for talking about when do the teachers come in and how do they feel comfortable with that? Because you can have the best solution. And Bernardo, even, I don't know, you were measuring the outcomes, right? Does that count for every lecture? Is every one of your staff, is everyone comfortable to get the same outcome out of your system yet? It's a, it's a great question. And I think that that could be a whole topic in itself, right? Mm -hmm. To a certain extent, first of all, there's GDPR compliance. So you need permission from the teacher to even consider uh, measuring to that extent. Mm -hmm. What I'm explaining is the capability, not the outcome. The outcome mm -hmm. comes from the university having the the right to do so. And normally, let's be honest, universities do get the rights because it's part of their contract and contractual agreements. Uh, when you go to a database, whether it is your, um, you know, your your uh, your uh, student learning uh, system, whatever you use, you will have, or the students and the teachers will give you rights that they don't even necessarily know how, what they're complaining to. But that's not on us. That's on the university. That is as demanding that information. Now, you also tackled the fact that it's expensive. It's just as expensive as your needs are, right? It doesn't need to be expensive. It needs to be purposeful. And it needs to be flexible and scalable. So for it to be scalable, the element of costing comes at a very different level. How do you get your students? So I know, Mo, that you have a virtual learning platform at your institution, which is different to what we suggest. And I'm not disputing that it's still valid and still useful, but it's about how do you bring that, that multiple systems into an ecosystem, right? The ecosystem of the university bringing the best to each course, to each, uh, to each uh, uh, method of learning. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'd like to add. Yeah, yeah come, come, please. Um, so for us, we've been doing online education for over 25 years. Uh, we're one of the two universities ever created by a U.S. president in the U.S. We're both a two-year and a four-year university for associate's and bachelor's degree. So we address kind of a different population from the executive MBA side. And so we are offering um, for our international students a discount for their tuition because it's about for us, it's about accessibility. And we are giving them more. It, it does cost us more because we do have custom cohorts. We have custom uh, solutions. As it turns out, you know, we, you know, in, in our students in China, we're using WeChat so that they could access their professors at any given time, right? Uh, we're also leveraging the current technology that exists already within, you know, Canvas and Blackboard, where, uh, you know, you have your platforms that, that they can leverage from. But then I think curriculum that you guys were discussing is very true. Um, I think what Bernardo has is extremely interesting because when you start to get into the lab space, VR is the right solution if you want to do it remotely. It, it you know, AR and VR, right? But then I'm also curious from the the, the European Commission side because you're addressing such a broad population, right? Because there's we all agree there's not one size fits all. How do we address both ex, you know both extremes? of uh, students because some may not have the means to have a VR in their house or at their facilities. How do we do all that? Precisely, thank you. Uh, you know, I would just like to say, we're going through a tremendous change in the sense that uh, because of COVID, suddenly in Europe, and I'm just talking about the Europe perspective, you had 95 million students, and I'm talking about you know kids six years of age up to a uh, university student, 95 million learners that from one day to the other were sent home. And you can imagine that it didn't all work perfectly like maybe it works in the higher education sector. I mean, even in the higher education sector, for sure, you had some difficulties. But imagine what this was for small kids and for system, a school system that is not prepared to be online. Mm -hmm. And 95 million people going home from one day to the other. 8 million teachers being told 
from one day to the other that now you're not going to uh, be teaching in front of a, a classroom with 20 people uh, sitting in front of you, but you're going online. So it's been incredibly disruptive. And our concern from a policy point of view is uh, not so much to care for the ones that manage to uh, you know, adapt to the system easily, like in the high uh, education. And you just mentioned that uh, in your particular case, you've been uh, working online at university for more than 25 years. In fact, in the UK, there's the Open University has been doing distance learning for, for decades as well and very good yeah. quality. Our concern is for all the others, you know, the kids that go home and uh, they don't even have a computer at home and I expected to follow these classes. The ones that don't have the internet or the ones that, you know, have parents that can help them with the homework, the things they have to do at home and the others that are completely lost, have nothing. And what, you know, the, the, the impact this has in increasing the social gaps in access to education and the impact this will have uh, uh, on the longer term. And, you know, this disruption included also everything that has to do with examinations. If we're talking about K-12 uh, you know, because you need certain examinations and to have access to a higher education in, in most countries in Europe. And because of COVID, all of this was disrupted. We are very concerned with the uh, school dropouts that might increase uh, significantly as a result of this. Kids that uh, feel disengaged from the system precisely because at home they either don't have good internet connection or they don't even have a computer in some cases and what are the implications for this. And in this respect, we, we came out with um, a digital education action plan, which is basically a sort of a policy orientation uh, uh, to provide some kind of guidance on the work that is going to be done and just not to uh, 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 prolong myself too much to say that there's two two basic areas in which we are going to work. One has to do with the infrastructure. So infrastructure in terms of schools, universities, so the whole education system that in many cases is not prepared at all, unlike uh, your university is not prepared at all for distance learning. Uh, I mean, if, just look at the statistic. We, we ask teachers, these 8 million teachers, how do they feel comfortable in adapting to this new reality of distance learning? I'm not talking about higher education, all the teachers, the 8 million teachers. And only 39% of them considered that they had the skills to engage in online learning. So imagine what the learning experience is going to be when less than half the teachers are even comfortable in using uh, digital tools themselves. Imagine yeah. the this hand. That's an amazing point, Joel. But you're speaking about adoption. And adoption is key there. Right. So how do universities or institutions or or uh, middle, lower and high school bring innovation? Because we need to innovate. We need to be able to be flexible and adapt, but also bring an adoption process. So I know that systems like ours, but others will have an adoption process. So isn't that about how the university or how the institution really ensures that their staff is trained properly and emerges into the experience. Okay. It's no. not based on the system in itself. Yeah, I'm curious what Jiao thinks about like the, the digital readiness, because you're talking about adoption and then it sounds again, I think, technology led. And what if we talk about the teacher led? And if we talk about these eight million teachers that Jiao mentions, mm. how does the European Commission think as a holistic view, like how we can get all these 8 million teachers digital ready and yeah. not only adopting the technology, but also the skill sets as yeah. we talked about. Yeah. I think it is, um, uh, uh, unfortunately, there's no easy solution. And what happens is that we found uh, significant deficiencies in the training, the initial training of teachers. You know, the teachers that go to university to become teachers and so on, most of them, in fact, more than half of them in Europe would not ever exposed. Just look at this. Some countries, I'll take uh, uh, um, Bulgaria. More than 50% of the uh, of the teachers are above 50 years of age. So we're talking about people that went to universities 30 years ago. I mean, you know, uh, uh, 30 years ago, the, I remember when I started working at the commission, we didn't even have email. So you can imagine these people went through a formative process where digital skills was not part of the curriculum given to the initial teaching of teachers. And I think it's not only this, the preparation of the initial uh, uh, 
training of the teachers, but also on their continuous development process. Because today you have kids that are much more digital aware than the teachers themselves. And this poses a very problem. I don't think there's an easy solution from one day to the other. We'll have, uh, we'll have a, a very big challenge there. But just what I was just finalizing, and then uh, uh, I'll stop my intervention. Just to say in the Digital Education Action Plan, we have two big uh, uh, um, pillars of strategy. One which has to do with the infrastructure elements, both at home and in the schools and universities. And another one that has to do with the skills content itself. How do we prepare people, and I'm talking about very young people, to have the digital skills that will allow them to engage in this kind of uh, remote learning, to be capable of using virtual reality, all these tools that are there, 3D printers, be digitally aware. This is a very big challenge. So we're talking about content of uh, what we are teaching, as well as the infrastructure elements that will allow to convey this content, especially in a, a period like we have now with the COVID-19 and with the lockdowns that are happening all over Europe. Um, Joao, there was just one, uh, sorry, we've, we've got Salva, but I'll, I'll wait, but I will ask a question in a second, but Salva, sorry, you, you, you wanted to ask something. Um, yeah, I, I agree with uh, what Joao is saying. What are the jobs? But uh, I, I mean, I think it's not just a problem of infrastructure and teachers. It's also a problem of the staff. Again, don't forget that if we are moving to online teaching, it's not that just the teacher. We need also the, the staff that it's ready and that knows the technologies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is important. This is really important. Thank you. Okay. On that point, if I can just say, yeah, and I believe Murd said it as well, tech. Uh, tech is uh, uh, when you bring tech into education you need to make sure that it's education uh, it's tech for education and not education for, uh, not not the other way around right so uh i think that when you look at that point and the and picking up on what um uh, um salvatore mentions and it i'm gonna uh, uh, add against or uh, uh, uh provoke as well sought i believe that the idea is you should have always something that is built with the teachers in mind, with the institution in mind. So we pride ourselves in that. We started with the university, we started with the business, and we always listen to our, if you will, sense of community, it's our, our, our end users, and build upon it. We listen to them, we, we feed that back, we build on it to have always the easiest, the most flexible, most adaptable towards the audience that is using it. And so if we look at our audience and we listen to our audience, only then we can actually adapt to be uh, to be a better at a better place, right? So we actually try to bring them on board and feed into our roadmap to improve ourselves. Obviously, it won't, uh, we won't be able to solve all the problems of every teacher like Juan uh, clearly mentions, but anything we can do to improve that, we will, because that's our core, our core essence, really. Okay, Mark? Yeah, then if we talk about this digital readiness again, but it's because of course, as a software developer, and, and I've talked to them also a lot, you can listen to your end user and be like, what can we change, what can we adapt, squeak a little bit. But I'm curious if I ask Rod, you say we've been doing this for 25 years already. How are your lectures? Are they all capable of completely working well with the systems? Can they integrate VR seamlessly? Or is it also a mental, like a mindset thing that's playing here? Uh, we, we split them, uh, to be honest, by uh, domestic and international students because domestic, domestic students that we have that are remote learners are much more adapted already to asynchronous. So for that, they really don't need a ton of the AR, VR because they're self-learners and they're probably putting themselves their, or their family through, uh, you know, they're, they're both working and studying at the same time. And then you have the other extreme, which are international learners, which are distributed all over the world. So tech then does become an issue, whether or not they have a VR headset will become an issue. Mm. Um, what we're seeing is that things such as labs are extremely, th there's, a, there's a great need for AR, VR to be used in labs. Yeah. Um, I've seen a lot of vocational trainings, which actually uh, allows you to fix a HVAC, 
using uh, AR VR without actually touching a physical unit. And I think those type of things are extremely interesting to adapt into higher education. And it's about I think making it easy. It's a good right. moment. For me to put, it's a good moment for me to put this another question sort of to the whole panel for you all to kind of discuss. But um, you know, how how can tech be used to deliver hard skills? You know, such as when it comes to uh, being in labs. So it'd be interesting to hear what you you all think on that point. Yeah, so I think AR VR is a is a great example of teaching vocational students who actually may need a certain skill sets. They may not they they may not be looking for a bachelor's degree. They're looking for hard skills that will allow them to, um, you know, get into a job. I think it's a collaboration between co corporations and universities as well as tech companies to create that solution so that they have a path to a a uh, employment right because that's ultimately the goal. Mm -hmm. Mild, so, yeah. I just want to quickly get back. If we think about what Jiao just, just said with, for example, Bulgaria or the 8 million uh, lecturers or teachers, that a lot of them, they don't have these access to VR, AR, right? So what if we bring the discussion back to also, I saw Albert in the chat saying that the connectivities and the devices, they still remain a major issue. How can we as a community, instead of saying, okay, we can use VR, AR, still make sure that other skills are learned online even if you don't have the resources maybe that's a good like question back to us um yeah because not I everyone has these access has the access right what do you think draw about that do i pronounce your name correctly uh, no but don't worry i'm used no, to it but I want to. unless you are a portuguese speaker you won't Draw be able out. to say it so <laughs> anything I, I, anything that starts with a j i accept as a as a connection <laughs> so um well you know i i think that uh, there is no uh, real alternative to that because uh, you, you the education system is going through a transformational process. I think that digital is uh, was already in our agendas for many, many years. What COVID did basically is brought a sense of urgency that we didn't have before. You know, in all our policy documents from the European Commission, in all the things we're doing with the member states, we've all for years been saying that, you know, the new technologies, we've got to embrace them. We've got to make sure that education and training is transformed. We've got to rethink how learning and our teaching takes place the traditional role of teachers has to be changed. We've been saying this for years. The thing is that before March this year, we sort of had a time horizon of, you know, we have five years, three years, five years, maybe 10 years to do it. <laughs> and then suddenly nobody was expecting. And from one day to the other, it's these 95 million learners that uh, no longer had a school or university to go to. So I think it's a transformation process that was, uh, as I said, the sense of urgency became much more pertinent now since March, and it's going that way. I think it's inevitable. It's not a matter of uh, of finding ways of going back because the going back will not happen. We'll all we've all uh, been transformed by this. The way we work, the way we learn, the, the way we shop, the way we do our normal lives, the way that now we're engaging in, in getting you know Uber Eats coming up with food for us and so on. I think the whole. The whole COVID crisis brought a sense of urgency to many aspects of our life, and we'll have to adapt in the education and training system, which has been very conservative. If you think of what education and training was 200 years ago and what it is today, it hasn't changed much, really. And, but COVID brought us, uh, you know, it's like a slap in the face and say, you guys get your act together and do something about it. Really bring digital into the schools, into the way we think we think of teaching and learning in a completely radical way. And that's what I think is going to have to happen and is happening, in fact. Um, I, I've, there's so many questions I want to keep asking, but I'm, I'm conscious that at some point we're going to um, probably want to go to uh, the audience and, and, and get some of their questions answered. Let me just ask one last thing, and that's around um, how students have uh, received online teaching so far, you know, because I think that's really important to hear, you know, whether um, that they're able to sort of learn better, perhaps, you know, using sort of classroom tech. Or could you um, speak a bit to that? And, and maybe we'll hear from maybe uh, Salvatore or, or, or Mild or, 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 or Rad or whoever, but yeah, feel free to discuss <laughs> that point. Yeah, I myself actually had a lot of conversations also with the students directly because I just wanted to know. I was like, I don't want to be in like, oh, I'm leading the projects, but I have no clue what's going on. So mm -hmm. they both both qualitative and quantitative research. 
And it was interesting on the hybrid part, I saw that like 74% of all students, they preferred having this hybrid Zoom lecture over a normal Zoom lecture. I was kind of surprised because it is still a Zoom lecture, but then it's in the more fancy way where they have more interaction and a very small group of students can actually physically be there. So it was good to see that they prefer this hybrid way. Um, but then if you ask them, do you prefer this type of education or going back to a normal on-campus lecture? Most of them, I think, but it was like 64% say, okay, no, I want to go to back to normal on-campus education. But not everybody. <laughs> but, yeah. So that was interesting. Sorry, Bernardo. Bring the about well-being and about having a sense of social interaction and the lack of uh, connectivity and maybe I'm speaking out out of place, but some of the of the options are quite flat. So you need to, to try to to innovate and try to to change the the, the environment, the setting. Right. Uh, I think that that's uh, a, a key a key concern. The, it's just one more point. You spoke. Yeah. We spoke about the teachers and the difficulty of them learning from Hungary and so on. But what about the students that are abroad? Do they have the connectivity to be able to engage in your in, in set platforms and and bring them into that uh, environment? If they can't uh, learn from Hungary, can they learn from other institutions? Institutions have partnerships. They have joint degrees. They have other facilities. Can they just resource it? As long as the connectivity is a, a concern and it is taken into consideration to reduce that part, to give a, a, as good of an experience to the student wherever he is. I'm going to have to, um, I, I know we could keep speaking about this for, for forever, um, but but I, I think it'd be good if we um, got some of the audience's questions answered now. Um, the most uh, upvoted question so far is uh, from Kevin um, Santos, and is how can you harness the positive impacts of a virtual learning environment uh, to effectively market to prospective students? Any tips is what we've got there. Um, so who, who would like the impact? Yeah, so do you mean by, I, Kevin asked the question, right? I see it in the screen now. Harness the positive in, impacts to effectively market it. I think if you know how to speak the language of the students and that's also what i wanted to I, I talked a little bit about the quantitative part right about the reaction of students but there's also the qualitative aspect and we talk to students really in like focus groups and ask them how do you feel about it and then if you understand their language about how they feel how they are lonely being there behind their computers I don't see myself anymore, but I do no, hear I myself. Yeah. We yeah. can hear you. <laughs> okay, that it doesn't matter. But Kevin, I, I see that it 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 makes a lot of a difference how which tone of voice you use for your students. So a lot of universities are like online education. Uh, come study at our university. We have the best technology. We do it very well. Come study with us. But if you talk about this experience, about the campus experience, how do you feel when you're studying with us? How do you feel when you're in an online group with mm. your uh, fellow classmates? And then, you, as uh, Bernardo said, you need to be creative. And a few examples is, for example, a lot of universities have that already, but a mentor system. Okay. Make sure that they all have mentors. And the other tip, the last one, yeah, sorry, sorry. as a creative tip, what other people can do. I heard last week one university said that they um, actually order, for example, cooking uh, materials. They order food and they deliver it at people's homes and they do online cooking classes. Nothing related to the content, but all related to socializing. And those things also, if you measure it afterwards, really really uh, work well for the experience the social experience i think you'll like this one we have someone that teaches how to dj yeah. to, to students to 12 to 18 year olds so it's it's changing the format and trying to really give something back right it's but i'm yeah. sure that salvatore is an expert in that field considering it's an online university yeah i i'm i i would suggest also that we should not forget that students going to the online university, they have a different profile. So 
don't forget that now we are talking about the COVID situation and we are talking about of a university going online because students they cannot to the campus but do not forget that we have also a big portion of potential students who cannot get a physical a face-to-face -face, uh, university they cannot attend university because they work or because they have uh, they are far from the cities and so there is also another profile so when we were born as university we were born as, as online university because we were trying to give a service to those students. and we have been growing a lot during these years and now because we learn a lot about how we're using technology in teaching then we are moving also to the let's say traditional students and as we i can guarantee to you that our classical students they like oh, the way of, of uh, learning online because probably the majority of them they work and they can do it from uh, during the the the, 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 the night and so on but the new students they also like it also because we were able to bring technologies new technology to those guys yeah um rad can i, can I pose that yeah sorry you, you put your finger up for me <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, no question about I, 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 we're, we're seeing extremely interesting situation because in your custom cohorts that we actually have, we have students from all over, let's use China as an example. We have students from all over China that's taking our online courses. They've never met each other in their life because they participate in our online cohort. They're all gonna vacation and take online classes together coming up on the 21st of November. We're actually gonna have to make them sign a waiver because of uh, liability issues. But at the same time, it's extremely fun because these students who would, would have never met each other right uh in their life now are meeting each other and then most likely they'll be coming to our physical campus in fall when everybody is uh ready to come right uh, assuming everything uh, with COVID is better but we're seeing a different dynamic and really positive dynamic where you know in cities that has 5g in china they're running faster off of their phones than they are with um with their internet with wi-fi so a lot of these students are actually taking classes while they're on, um, you know, on a bullet train, right? And it's, 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 uh, I think it just changes the whole entire dynamics of how technology and learning is because one of the things um, I think there, there's, you know, what Bernardo was saying was, you know, partnership with institutions if you actually have location challenges, if there's connectivity or, um, you know, certain students have less access to Wi-Fi or technology, then maybe there's learning center opportunities that could be created that opens up opportunities. And then you have others which loves the mobility. These students love the mobility that today I could be in one city and tomorrow I could be in another city. I'm not tied to a physical campus, which goes towards, um, you know, I think Salvatore's uh, 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 realm, I think. And, and I think that's extremely interesting because what we're seeing also in the pace, uh, asynchronous and synchronous is the asynchronous students, if you're excel you know a really good student you have you know i think a lot of the teachers that's actually on the platform was saying about curriculum if you have an excellent curriculum that's built they could actually pace a lot faster and finish certain things a lot faster than other students which is the middle of the pack students so i think it's the combination and every school going back to the question that the other gentleman asked was every school i think will have to play to their strength because different schools are targeting different types of students and so not one size fits all as what uh, I think Bernardo was saying in the beginning, right? Yeah, completely. And I yeah, think your competitive you mentioned advantage. Sorry, don't, sorry, sorry. I just said to look for your competitive advantage. Where do you add value as a university? But I, if I can just go back, I think that he said an amazing thing that was perhaps just missed. He spoke about the sense of community, creating that you know that readiness that uh, that vibe that we are all together which has never been as important as it has been emerged now right so we should all providers uh, institutions uh, you know public sector come together or or in your case well editors uh, uh, and you know bring together that sense that we all belong together and deliver back it's not about just just about taking in it's about giving back and how do you give back 
whatever it may be, it always needs to be with your audience in mind. And I think that's, that's, that's crucial. So I, I really appreciate you bringing that point back. And uh, I think that uh, creating the sense of community is always important. In, in terms of um, community, um, we, we've had a question uh, from, from the audience, um, from Claire, uh, that says, what, what does the best sort of interactive classroom mean for students and their peer engagement? I think it's quite interesting because we've been speaking about, you know, teachers and, and students, but, you know, how, how, do you, um, how can classroom tech sort of be used to sort of promote peer engagement? Um, Bernardo, do you, yeah. Or, well, well Thank you, but I, I think that that puts us at an advantage, admittedly. But truth is, because of the the way our system interacts, I can really see the person in big, and I have directional audio, so the person actually speaks to me from where they are positioned in the room, and they have a dedicated webcam. So when I come to them and speak to them, everyone sees me sideways, and I can bring that bigger. Face-to-face uh, -face engagement, even though it's virtual, everyone is first stage here. And when it's peer-to-peer, -peer, I can pull any other student to give actually a speech and pull him back to the front of the classroom, like if it was a remote host. So you can actually, there's so many ways that you can bring peer-to-peer uh, -peer engagement, whether it is through remote hosting, whether it is through breakout groups and giving them uh, an opportunity to really engage and really get uh, interacting just between themselves. Sometimes, even if it is just to talk, right? And to talk about life, it's important. And the, the systems that you use need to be ready for that. Yeah, okay. And, and I've just got to ask Joelle one, uh, one question, which is, uh, I've been really interested by it. In terms of um, funding um, and uh, what you're doing in terms of uh, funding different universities that might uh, be, be bringing classroom tech innovations. Could you sort of just talk me through any examples you have of, of, of work that you've been funding? Yes, we have, you know, at the European level, uh, first, first of all, let me say that the, uh, the gross of the funding is each member state provides it. You know, the, the EU budget, if you look at it, it's, it's uh, a fraction of the EU GDP. It's less than 1%. It's around 1%. So the, it's not that we have tremendous amounts. But what we are doing, we are focusing uh, most of the financial instruments we have at European level. Of course, Erasmus+, Plus, everyone knows about it and uh, what is also being done. We had very recently a specific call for digitalization in the education and training sector, but we've got many other funds, the European structural funds in each country that they can allocate these funds that are given uh, to the to the countries in order to uh, to uh, develop digital uh, tools and digital infrastructure in the education system. We've got funds, Invest EU, and we've got the gigantic fund which is now being put available for the member states, which is the Recovery and Resilience Facility with more than 650 billion euros, not million, billion euros, in which countries can use for other reforms, for the recovery post-COVID as well, but also for education and training. So we have a multitude of uh, financial instruments that are there, some of them for direct application by universities or, or vocational centers, mainly when we're talking about uh, Erasmus+, Plus, but the others through national uh, programs that are then uh, run through calls in which universities can apply for it. For, and I would just mention among all those for universities, one of the kind of flagship uh, programs that we have now for uh, at university level with Erasmus, which is the European universities, which really has uh, as its uh, basic idea, create a European area for education and training in which, you know, courses will be developed together among universities, research projects will be done together among these universities, and also this element of digital and going online and having this virtual mobility taking place of learners and teachers is one of the key elements as well. Can I just throw one last quick question uh, at all of you? I'm sorry about that, but I'm, I'm, I'm interested to sort of hear which institutions are most likely um, to sort of engage with classroom tech. Um, some, some, you know, is it a sort of one, one fit uh, for all or, you know, are there certain universities which are more... Um, Mal, do you want to speak to that? 
Yeah, well, it's interesting, right? We did talk about this competitive advantage thing. We talked about the differences between schools uh, all over the world, uh, rich countries, poor countries, everything, right? So, of course, there's no one size fits all. And every university needs to look into how can we do that with the resources we have? Uh, and of course, it's really great that there's so much funding for it as well. Probably a lot of universities are not aware of how much funding they could get for, for those projects. So, yeah, it also depends on the size of the, of the institution. And it was interesting, last week I had a similar webinar like this, and there was an American institution, and it was all about winning about which one is of the universities is winning who has better online education and i completely understand in the market well for europe and especially in the netherlands all universities are public most of them so there's a complete different area of this competitive advantage but i think and that was also my answer to the previous question if you listen to your students listen to what they want and ask specific questions about the the peer interaction don't be like, oh, we created a mentor program, it's gonna work fine. No, ask them, do you prefer a mentor program? Do you want to do a game online or do you prefer it to be content related? So in general, as a summary, every university does it different. They look for their competitive advantage, but listen to your students and focus on that. I think that's a brilliant uh, point to end with really. Um, so um, look, I just wanna say thank you so much. It's been a really, really fascinating conversation. I've really enjoyed it. Um, so thank you very much to our panel. Uh, thank you to our audience who have uh, you know, attended, but also asked some, some great questions. Um, and we look forward to seeing you um, at the next Pi webinar. Um, thank you very much um, and goodbye. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so thank much. You yes. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs>